Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another uh, St. Denny's Simple Service uh, online uh, with me, Phil. Uh, Kat, I think, is going to be uh, speaking to us later and uh, putting this whole thing together. Um, so this morning, uh, just to um, start off our worship with a gathering prayer. Uh, the words on the screen, uh, if you want to join and say them with me. Lord, it's so easy to be part of the crowd following behind others, not knowing what's taking place in front. Give us the power to make our way through the moving throng and the courage to touch you, to receive that life transforming experience. But we also ask that you stop and turn around and call us by name, saying those words that make us know that we are completely forgiven and unconditionally loved. Amen. So uh, today's uh, reading, or in the, the passage today, we're going to see some of the kind of societal, bar uh, societal barriers that might have put people off, deterred people from asking Jesus for help, and then uh, we'll see Jesus' generosity in responding. Now, in terms of practical tasks today, I've uh, once again raided the children's toy boxes, uh, and I've got my Lego out here, because uh, I was thinking about... Maybe if I... Yeah, there we go. Live demonstration. Um, thinking about things that create barriers in our lives. I've already started building this little barrier here. And I'm going to keep adding uh, little bricks uh, along here. And thinking about, well, what are the things that uh, are barriers in our lives? The kind of structural things like where you live or uh, maybe emotional elements like uh, prejudices that you might hold. I don't know, there's a, a variety of uh, structural barriers out there and you can see my poor Lego people there are now cut off uh, from each other. So maybe um, have a think about those barriers in our own lives uh, for a bit uh, and what they are. And actually that these barriers that we create, these uh, walls that we kind of put up, don't just keep other people out, um, but they kind of trap us in as well. So why is it so hard to overcome these walls in our own life? I've almost built that perfectly. I'm quite surprised and proud of my achievements uh, in Lego. Oh no, I've run out, I've run out of bricks. Um, so why is it difficult to overcome the walls in our own lives and help others? Or maybe sometimes to, to seek the help that we uh, actually need. I guess we are we're kind of creatures of habit in the in the scheme of things, and it's uh, difficult sometimes to take us out of our comfort zones, um, and maybe even in uh, church as well, like physically in church where we choose to sit or who you choose to engage with. I mean, St. Denis is relatively uh, small in, in terms of community, so we I think most people know everyone, but maybe maybe we don't. Uh, and actually, next time you're physically in church, and I know with uh, COVID restrictions and things like that, um, moving around and physically interacting in church is quite difficult. But maybe do a, some sort of pew shuffle, you know, go to somewhere that you don't normally sit in church and uh, try and interact with people that maybe you haven't spoken to regularly before in church or certainly outside. Um, and I need to be a bit brave to mingle with people you don't know sometimes, but uh, go for it. Um, and, you know, maybe you'll uh, certainly sitting in church in a different place, you'll experience worship in a, a new way, maybe from a different perspective. Anyway, today's reading um, is a bit more evidence, really, that Jesus didn't uh, or had very few comfort zones and didn't really respect the, the social, cultural, religious barriers of his time. And he breaks the taboos and the conventions uh, so he could meet people and reach out to who, who are actually reaching out to him. Uh, and addressing their needs. So, uh, just in a second, we will hear that reading. Today's reading comes from Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 43. Jesus raises a dead girl and heals a sick woman. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered round him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders, named Jairus, came. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. And he pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so she will be healed and lived. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. 
and a woman was there who'd been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realised that power had gone out from him and he turned round in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciple answers, and yet you, you ask, who touched me? Well, Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? And overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. And he didn't let anyone follow him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. And he went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. And after he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were there with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old and they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. So that was uh, today's reading. And just before we uh, hear from Kat, I'll take you just into a time of confessional prayer. God of the streets and crowds of the world, we come to you in sorrow and shame. For the times we've allowed prejudice to distance us from those you would draw us close to. Raise us up to love and serve you. We bring you the times when people have been too proud to ask for help and too distracted to help for others. Raise us up to love and serve you. We acknowledge the times we've been quick to judge those who we don't easily identify with and ignores those whose plight we have not take to heart. Raise us up to love and serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So uh, we're going to hear from Kat and then uh, some music as well. And I will join you for the prayers of intercession after that. Let us pray before we begin. Lord, open our ears to hear your word, know your voice, speak to our hearts and strengthen our wills that we may serve you now and always. Amen. Of all the count encounters Jesus has over his years of ministry with complete strangers, I have to say this may well be one of my favourite. The entire passage is filled to the brim with people and actions that sit outside of the norm. This is quiet rebellion and people crossing boundaries and breaking rules, including Jesus. And if you don't know me very well, I love a bit of subversion and sneaky rebellion. To start us off, we have Jairus, a leader in one of the synagogues, prostrating himself before Jesus, begging desperately for help in front of a huge crowd of people. Being a synagogue leader, Jairus would have been a figure of high standing in that area and considered important, unlikely to be seen falling at anyone's feet. But his daughter is dying. And with the threat of losing someone he cares so much for, he will do anything. So Jesus agrees and they make their way to Jairus's home and the crowd follows, excited to see what will happen next. Among the crowd is a woman and she knows she shouldn't even be there. This unnamed woman has suffered for 12 long years from some sort of disorder that's affected her natural menstrual bleeding. The doctors who had cared for her 
only worsened her experience, leaving her penniless and even more unwell than before. If this wasn't hard enough, her continual bleeding, according to Jewish law, makes her ceremonially... Ooh, that's a big word. Ceremonially... Ceremonially unclean. She is ostracised from society because of it. No one must touch her because if they do, that will also make them unclean. Only recently we've been allowed to hug others beyond our household and yet this woman would have gone 12 long years without touching any other person. Can you imagine how difficult that must have been? And yet despite all of this, she is here in the middle of a bustling crowd pushing her way towards Jesus. This woman should be hiding away, but in this moment, in her desolation, she pins her last hopes to this man called Jesus. If I could just touch even his garments, I will be well again, she says, and she reaches out in faith. And it's instant. She feels well in her body that she is well again. She has been healed. And Jesus senses this and stops. He knew someone had touched him with a definite purpose in mind, a definite need. And they'd done so believing that through this act, God would give deliverance. He asks who it was and the woman, trembling with fear at what might happen to her, having touched someone in her unclean state, confesses all. She sat waiting for judgment. But Jesus didn't follow the norm. Daughter, your faith has made you well, he said. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Jesus calls this woman daughter, recognising that she too is a child of God, like any other person, like any other man, in fact. There is just This is just one of a number of occasions where Jesus treats women with respect in a time where women were considered inferior. And he's also not shunning this woman for being unclean or a social outcast, as he has also done on so many other occasions for those with leprosy and through his parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus has healed her, freeing her not only of her sickness, but of her unclean nature or state in the eyes of the law. But he's not done yet. Don't forget we have what is likely now quite an impatient and fraught gyrus waiting for Jesus to hurry up and see his own dying daughter. But it's too late. A message comes to them. They didn't make it in time. And she is gone. Jesus, not accepting this, tells a grieving Jairus, do not fear, only believe, and continues towards his home. Ignoring all the mocking and scoffing of those present, Jesus went and saw the child. Taking her hand, he commands her to get up and again, eats instant. Jairus's daughter rose up and began walking. Once again, here is Jesus having ignored the rules by touching a dead person who is also, like the bleeding woman, considered unclean. He again subverts the law of nature by raising this child from death. I mean, that is an awful lot of unconventional rule breaking in this passage, both from Jesus and the people alike. So am I condoning full-scale rule-breaking and rebellion? Not necessarily. This passage, I think, tells us a few things. It tells us a bit more about the nature of Jesus, about the sort of man that he was and the sort of God that he is. Jesus heals both the societal outcast and the rich daddy's daughter, both of whom, by their very nature of their gender, are already lesser in this society. But he doesn't see a difference between these two women, nor between them and their male counterparts. To Jesus, we are all equals. Maybe it is a comfort to know that. 
In the eyes of God, we are all equal and are treated with love and respect by him. Or perhaps this challenges you to your own reaction to societal outcasts or people who are discriminated against. Would you be willing to care for them if it meant risking your own status? Do you treat everyone equally as Jesus did, ignoring patterns of discrimination and prejudice set by the world? It also illustrates Jesus as God incarnate and healer. Earlier in Mark's gospel, we already hear of Jesus' power over nature, the elements and demons, as he calms the sea on the sea on he calms the storm on the Sea of Galilee and when he commands a demon to leave a man. Now with these two women, he reveals his authority over sickness and death. According to the old ceremonial law, Jesus should have been made unclean by touching the bleeding woman and Jairus' daughter. But we see the total opposite. Not only is he made, not made unclean, but he heals them because he is the fulfilment of the law. Jesus cleanses all he touches, and that includes ourselves. Do you just need to hear that today? That to Jesus, your status or cleanliness or acceptance in society doesn't matter. Because we're all in need of Jesus' healing touch and can be made clean by it. And finally, let's just take a little look at the other people in the passage. Jairus and the bleeding woman take risks here of their reputation, of their personal safety, and they put their faith in Jesus. They are stepping out of the norm, beyond the rules of society they're bound to, and in their desperation, reaching out to Jesus. Mike last week said that courage is as much part of faith as trust, and I think Jairus and the bleeding woman show this to us. They were strong in the face of struggle. And Jesus tells them, do not fear, only believe. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. So is your faith a comfortable one? Do you ever take risks and step out in faith? How far does your trust in God stretch? Are you create courageous enough to believe that God will be faithful even when we are seemingly out of options? And can you think of how you might do something different or out of the norm that is part of your faith? So we've got Jesus the rebel who treated everyone equally and heals all. Or Jairus and the bleeding woman bravely transgressing norms through their faith some really interesting people and actions in this passage that you might like to reflect on and relate to today. And I'm just going to finish off by repeating Jesus's words from today, words he might be speaking to you here and now. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Don't be afraid just believe. Amen.
So uh, thank you to Kat and the musician for those words and worship. And it's uh, time to take you through to our intercessional prayers now. Uh, you can see there the uh, words are on the screen and the kind of response is, Lord, pour out your blessings. Lord God, you became poor so that we might become rich. And in our world of inequality, we pray that you would show us how to share our riches with those who are in need. Lord, pour out your blessings. We pray for people who seek asylum in our land. We can't begin to understand the things that they've been through. We pray for a deep sense of your understanding and for practical ways to show your love. Lord, pour out your blessings. We pray for those who work long hours for very little money, for those who have no security, no comfortable home to go back to. Lord, pour out your blessings. We pray for those who give their time and resources, working through food banks, outreach centres, charities. Lord, pour out your blessings. We pray for ourselves, that as you bless us, we will bless others. Lord, pour out your blessings. Amen. So uh, we're coming to the uh, end of today's uh, service online. And um, it's a usual kind of point to think about how we can put our faith into action. We uh, may be thinking about barriers today. Well, I certainly had fun building some stuff with Lego, uh, at least. Uh, and um, maybe as you go about your daily business, uh, take a note of any time that you come across some sort of barrier. It could be a, a physical thing, um, like, uh, I don't know, kind of a, a building without ramps. I certainly found uh, five years or four years ago when I had my knee operation done. It's quite humbling because you, you don't realise how much of a world we live in that's kind of designed for the able body uh, able body and you really take for granted the access that you had with things when you have a full range of movement um or maybe the the barriers that you might spot this way uh, this week might be communication issues um again from my own kind of experience like one of the play groups i go to a lot of the mums their uh, their english isn't their first language so we've got a kind of uh, a barrier that's built up there it might maybe it's something else entirely that you might spot this week but take a look out uh, for those barriers and then think well what can be done and what would be needed to overcome that barrier and is there actually anything practical that you could do perhaps anyway uh, we will uh, bring this service to a close with a closing prayer I hope you have uh, a lovely week um, and hopefully see you in church uh, what, in July oh dear the summer's escaping already anyway here we go Lord, as we head into a new week, help us to be people who choose to stand out from the crowd rather than simply follow it. By the power of your spirit, help us to also step out of our comfort zones and give us the courage to challenge barriers that confine or constrain or control us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Right, uh, so that is it. Uh, for today. Have a lovely week and see you soon. Bye.